Welcome back to Newsmakers. Dan Cummings here. Our conversation today with the incumbent Republican representative in central New York's 24th Congressional District. We welcome John Katko to our program. And you may as well take a look at the map if you're not really sure, and some people aren't, you know, where they live or who they're supposed to vote for. Where If you live in Wayne County, Cayuga County, Onondaga County, or Oswego County, up to the western half. The western half. Yeah. Includes the, the city of Fulton and Oswego. Right. That's the 24th Congressional District, folks. And somewhere... If you're, well, if you're a registered Democrat, you might be voting in June, but if you're registered anything, you'll be voting hopefully in November. The congressman's running for re-election, uh, still on the threat of terrorism. After Brussels especially, John, uh, ISIS is obviously a, a major problem for Europe and by extension for us if we don't keep our, our act together. But the president this week said, on the, at least on the ground in Iraq, he expects that the city of Mosul will be retaken and out of ISIS hands by the end of this year. Um, and we're putting more advisors on the ground, though. Tell me, I just want to ask you first of all, are you comfortable with the president's policy towards ISIS right now? No, because I don't think he had a policy for a long time, and I think that's why ISIS has get, gotten to the point where they're, they're so strong. I literally was at the front end of where ISIS was in, in Baghdad when I was over there as part of the task force that I led, uh, looking at uh, terrorism issues. And you could literally see the plumes of smoke from the rocket attacks from ISIS not far from Baghdad. Um, Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq, and uh, to, to say that it's going to be overtaken at any time is, is probably not the right thing to do. And uh, you know, I think we, you know, what we need to do going forward is to definitely have more advisors there, more people training their military, time, and making sure that they can do it themselves and providing the proper air, uh, air support But he for thinks them. that by doing that, an increasing number of advisors, it will help retake not only Mosul, but perhaps other ISIS-held land and get that part of the fight over. I guess if, the idea being if you could take enough of their land away, eventually all of it, that, and then you take their oil money as well, you've, you've cut off their resources. But you're not comfortable. Are you okay with the number of advisors we're putting? That can also get escalated in a hurry, too. You know, I, I, I've said uh, repeatedly uh, from the time I was a camp, in a campaign and throughout time as a congressman, I think American boots on the ground in combat positions should be a thing of very last resort for us. I don't think we're there yet. I think having us over there to train them and help them fight their own battles, I think is a great thing. I think us providing air support is a great thing. We should continue to do that. But also, even with respect to the air, air support and air uh, engagement, we are, they are so limited in what they can do because of the rules of engagement by this administration. For example, the oil trucks leaving Iraq, I mean, in Syria, that from uh, that are ISIS controlled, that are pumping the money and, and that have helped them fuel their terrorism. Uh, they drop leaflets, Americans do, and say, we're going to bomb you guys if you, if you come out of there with, with the trucks full of oil. Mm. And we can't drop bombs on those trucks until you know who the driver is. And that, that's a bit much. I think at some point you've got to gotta take the gloves off and say we're serious about really wanting to stop these guys, both economically and militarily. From the air, though, that would be those strikes are... are Effective and good. Oh, when yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It cuts off the economic uh, lifeblood of, the, of, of what ISIS is doing. And if you cut that off, you, you strangle them even more. After Brussels, there was much, many calls to get everybody's intelligence talking, but obviously Europe didn't have it all together. France and, and Brussels and Belgium was a mess, and it created tremendous tragedy that day in, in Brussels. Do you, from your position on the Homeland Security Committee, do you get a good sense that either with U.S. help or without it, Europe will be able to more solidly protect itself? Um, I think it has come from the world of people. They don't have it yet. Uh, after we left Baghdad, which I mentioned on that trip, we went to Turkey and then over to Western Europe. And Turkey, of course, now is, uh, has had several terrorist attacks. In Brussels, we were literally, when they showed us the attack scene in Brussels, it's literally where we were, talking to the folks at the EU. And the one thing we universally heard from all the Western European leaders was that their people are not willing to put up with some of the security uh, constraints that we put up with. The lines at the airport, having our backgrounds checked before you buy a ticket, giving your name and in your uh, birthday, things like that. To being checked before you, when you come and leave the country, they don't do a lot of that, and that's part of the problem. And until they do that, um, they're going to continue to have these vulnerabilities. They said to us when we were over there, which was quite prof uh, profound, I think, they said, we know a major attack is coming. And until that major attack comes, uh, we don't know if our people are going to be willing to take more security measures. To stop it. Even now that it's happened, mm. They're not sure, and that's what concerns me. The American people have had our 9-11. We don't want it to happen again. We're willing to put up with some things to, to stop that from happening again. Let me shift to domestic policy now. You have just this week written a sizable op-ed and on your position on parental, you call it parental savings account. Family leave uh, paid for, but voluntary. Mm -hmm. Why? The other people that I've had, the other three Democrats that have all been on this program, all say, we want mandatory family leave. 
Yeah, I think, yeah, I think outside the box. I think the government is not the magic elixir of all your problems. When you hear somebody say to you, I'm with the government, I'm here to help, you better get a little bit nervous because every time that happens, it seems to generate these gigantic bureaucracies. And I think this is a pretty stark contrast in their proposals. Mine simply says, if you have kids or you are uh, anticipating at some point having kids, you can save a little bit or a lot, however you want to do, up to a certain level by having pre-tax dollars, pre-tax dollars, put into a parental savings account, much like you have a health savings account. Mm -hmm. And from that fund, you can draw out in the first year, not just for leave, like the, the, their bill constructs, but for uh, child care related expenses, child care, diapers, buying a crib, all the things that you know, may be high costs for co-pays on your insurance premiums, whatever. You can do that for the first year. Now, if you save up for all those years, you don't, don't end up using it, you can roll that into a retirement account without any government interference. You don't need a government administration to administer it. You don't need another line on your, on your uh, pay stub, which shows another new, whole new line of taxes. Um, and by the way, for the people that are poor, they, it's strictly voluntary. Under their plan, they're talking about taxing every single man, woman uh, that's working in this country, uh, tax them no matter what. But, and employers too. And right? employers too. Now, uh, At least that, we, well, that would create more resources for everybody to take well, leave. Well, sure, That's but it. the bottom line is if we put, put the onus on American people, they will respond and they'll be responsible for the most part. And, and, if, and if employers want to use it as a recruiting tool, they can. We had a, a uh, rally, if you will, out at a female-owned uh, uh, warehouse, and uh, they thought the idea was great, and a lot of businesses think it's great because they want to be able to do it when the, when the economy is good and they can contribute when they can or to reward an employee. But, uh, you know, sometimes you just can't do it. And in this age of getting choked by taxes in New York State, for example, we're the 50th uh, last in the, in the nation as far as uh, business-friendly environments. You talk about another, who, another, another whole wave of taxes. It doesn't make sense. If you give the individual under pre-tax dollars, which they can save money doing that, and, and have them uh, have the choice of doing it, I think it's just a better idea, and it's a better way to go. We'll continue our conversation on other domestic issues and a little bit of politics, too, to wrap it up when we continue with John Katko after this.